From its opening day in 1992, Disneyland Paris, then Euro Disneyland, was played by cultural clashes, financial woes, marketing snafus, and even a terrorist attack. Less famous than Disneyland's disastrous opening day in 1955, Euro Disneyland certainly had its own opening day catastrophe. But even more than this, the following 100 days provide a fascinating tale but ultimately changed the course of Disney history forever. Before we dive into a detailed look at Euro Disney's first 100 days, it's important to have an overview of what preceded this. The project, long before completion, was plagued with problems. Prior to the park in Paris, Disney had opened their very first park outside America, Tokyo Disneyland, in 1983. For a first-time international effort, this park was a smash hit. Therefore, when Michael Eisner became Disney CEO a year later, in 1984, he was keen to replicate this success in Europe. The idea of building a park in Europe wasn't directly Eisner's, as Disney had already begun a bidding process on the location of Euro Disney in 1981. But Eisner's arrival and excitement for this concept certainly pushed the idea into reality. Beyond just the success of Tokyo Disneyland, there was another key reason Disney wanted to build a park in Europe. Europeans on average take five to six weeks of vacation a year, roughly double that of Americans. A factor that very much drove Disney to see Europe as a viable theme park destination. With this, Disney began to look at many destinations within the continent, ultimately leading to a choice between building a park in either France or Spain. The advantage of Spain was the warm climate, whereas the Paris site was seen as more accessible with it being less than a four hour drive from 70 million people and within a two hour flight of 300 million more. Although Disney's US parks are both situated in warm climates, the success over in Tokyo had shown Disney that a park could still work in an area which had cold winters. In Tokyo, covered waiting areas and additional indoor heat had proved adequate in combating the negatives of inclement weather. Thus, the advantages of building in France were seen as more advantageous than Spain's warm climate. With this, many of the techniques applied in Tokyo became essential precautions to the Euro Disney project. Disney even lent into the potential of a cold winter, building an ice skating rink in front of the Hotel New York, hoping this would add a specific winter appeal to the resort. Beyond this, the French government agreed to build new highways and railways to the site located 20 miles outside of Paris, and also offered a variety of other financial-based incentives if Disney signed a deal with the French government to locate Euro Disney in the village of marne la vallee in 1987. With all this, the deal was done, and Disney began to plan for the project, which now had a home. Five years later, on April 12, 1992, Euro Disney opened on time and within its $4.4 billion budget. Roy Disney, nephew of Walt, gave an opening day speech from a temporary platform built halfway up Sleeping Beauty's castle, but the crowd he was addressing was far smaller than expected. Despite all the incentives to build near Paris, when it came to announcing the project, reactions were not as positive as the company had seen over in Tokyo. The construction of a Disney park in France had been met with a lukewarm response by the French people. A significant proportion of France's intellectual community strongly voiced concerns that a Disney park near Paris would encourage what they considered to be an unhealthy brand of American consumerism. Even an aggressive marketing campaign with a $10 million budget plus an extensive cross-promotion with partner Nestle did little to persuade vast numbers of the French public to see the merits of Euro Disney. By opening day, there had been protests by staff and nearby residents worried about noise. Then, just the night before the park opened, a terrorist bomb had just missed disabling nearby electrical facilities. Thankfully, no one was harmed, but this frightening event certainly added to the park's negative image. Therefore, it's no surprise that opening day crowds were low. The park opened with 29 rides and attractions. The wider resort had six themed hotels with a total of 5,200 hotel rooms, the Davy Crockett Campground, a 27-hole championship golf course, and a variety of restaurants, shops, and live entertainment located in the Festival Disney Entertainment Center. The park's overall layout is similar to that of Disney's other castle parks, but the design did depart from these other parks in some substantial ways. These new decisions were mainly made in an attempt to accommodate the preferences of European guests and French culture. Disney's research had told them that Europeans visiting the United States were most interested in seeing Disneyland, New York, and Western America. 
As a result of this, the Euro Disney Resort had a large focus on Western theming. Three of the six hotels, Sequoia Lodge, the Cheyenne and the Santa Fe all had Western influence. What was called the Rivers of America in Disney's other frontier lands was called the Rivers of the Far West at Euro Disney. The park's version of Haunted Mansion, Phantom Manor was set in a mining town of the Old West within Frontierland, rather than New Orleans Square or Liberty Square as previously done. Disney also designed aspects of the park to imbue a more European flavour. Within Fantasyland, designs emphasised the fact that the classic fairy tales that inspired Disney's animated movies had their roots in Europe. Peter Pan's flight featured Edwardian-style architecture, Snow White found her home in a Bavarian village, Cinderella lived in a French inn and a European hedge maze themed to Alice in Wonderland was built. Discoveryland also featured a variety of tributes to European Renaissance heroes, particularly France's Jules Verne. Adventureland was designed to invoke memories of famous European adventure tales such as Sinbad the Sailor and Arabian Nights. Effort was certainly made to combat fears of Disney importing Americanism into France, but many of the cultural concerns expressed by the French public were nonetheless left unaddressed by Disney. One key failure was the food on offer. France has a strong food culture and Disney did attempt to provide a more international menu and higher quality food across the park than it had in Tokyo, which upon opening offered almost exclusively American cuisine. In Tokyo, this worked out okay, but in France, people were not happy. Another key issue was that Disney did not serve wine with meals, a serious departure from French culture. Thanks to all this, Euro Disneyland was not seen as an adequate day out location as dining needs could not be met. Another big issue was service. Early reviews pointed to the fact that customer service at Euro Disney fell way short of the standards set in the American parks. Disney had understood that providing their typical standard of customer service at Euro Disney was set to be a challenge. To try and get ahead of this issue, in September 1991, Disney opened a special center at Euro Disney's new Disney University, with the goal of training 10,000 employees within six months. As Europe was in a recession by opening day, attracting staff was not a problem, but Disney's employee standards, particularly Disney's strict grooming requirements at the time, were heavily criticised within France. Their best efforts to train their staff couldn't combat this reputation, and within the first nine weeks of operation, roughly 1,000 employees left Euro Disney. It seemed that transferring this American product, steeped in American culture, into the heart of Europe, with its vast number of distinct cultures, was even more difficult than Disney had anticipated. These were issues Disney did not face in Tokyo, as modern Japan looked at America for a vast amount of its pop culture. Thus, the Americanism that was seen as charming in Japan was seen as unappealing to the French audience. Disney had projected that 11 million guests would visit Euro Disneyland within the park's first year of operation. Despite poor attendance on opening day, 1.5 million people had visited Euro Disney by June the 9th. This meant that on average, nearly 200,000 people visited the park each week, meaning that if this attendance was maintained over a full year, roughly 10.5 million people would have visited the park, a number not too far from Disney's projection of 11 million. Despite continuing to struggle to attract nearby French residents, the number of international tourists visiting was actually higher than Disney had expected. But as French guests were predicted to make up half of the park's attendance, things still weren't looking too promising. A few weeks later, on July the 24th, Disney announced that despite their first quarter revenues of $451 million, the park was set to post a loss for its first fiscal year ending in September 1992. To try and sugarcoat this news, Eisner pointed towards the fact that early attendance was higher than at Disney's other three parks at comparable points in their history. However, this initial attendance did not tell the complete story. Disney's research had already shown them that attendance was likely to decrease drastically during the cold and wet fall and winter seasons, a prediction which proved to be true. Therefore, the numbers Eisner drew from gave a false reading as to the success of the park as they did not consider the impact the winter weather was set to have on attendance. As Disney approached the projected quieter months, advance bookings for this period were actually proving to be even lower than expected. Although Tokyo winters are cold like those in France, Paris has three times as many rainy days as Tokyo does during its winter season. 
Despite the fact that rainy theme park days are almost always less popular than dry ones, Disney overlooked this factor when predicting winter attendance to the park. Disney had also predicted that guests would spend more days at the resort than they actually were, another factor affecting revenue and predicted attendance. With six hotels and a campground, Disney was planning for overnight, even multiple night stays, but they seemed to have projected higher numbers for this, resulting in many empty hotel rooms. The first 100 days of Euro Disney had certainly proved challenging for Disney and little seemed likely to get better soon after. As winter struck and attendance dropped, Disney tried to cut operating costs where possible, including completely shutting the Newport Bay Hotel for a period of time, but this did not stop them from recording more and more losses. Looking back today at the chaos of Euro Disney's first 100 days at a time when Disneyland Paris is now a successful resort, it can be hard to grasp just how serious these problems were. In reality, it's far from over the top to claim that with the issues present in the park's first 100 days, and what proceeded in the following months and years, it's somewhat of a miracle that the resort even still exists, let alone is now considered a success. Thank you so much for watching. Did you visit Disneyland Paris within its opening year? If so, what do you recall from this time period? Please like, subscribe, and check out my links in the description.